Welcome to the wonderful world of programming using Java. This presentation introduces your first programming project in the class, the Paycheck Program. Watch this video carefully. It not only covers the first project, but many of the small details in the Java programming language. You may want to watch this video more than one time, especially if this is your first class in programming. You not only need to complete the project, but you also need to understand the information presented because it forms the basis for all the rest of the class. As the course progresses, you will be required to start projects from scratch and create the entire project yourself. I cover the Paycheck Lab assignment by discussing the project definition, how to develop an algorithm, entering and running the program, and completing and submitting the lab report and Java code. With Java, it really does not matter whether you are using a Mac, a PC, or Linux. Before you even start, I suggest that you create several folders on your computer or storage device. Main folder for Java programming class. One subfolder to keep copies of all your lab reports. Separate subfolder for each lab project. You may want another folder to keep copies of the class presentations. The college removes the Canvas web pages shortly after the class is over. Here is the project definition. Create a program using Java that does the following. Read the employee name, number of hours worked, and pay rate. Compute the pay, including overtime at time and a half. Compute the taxes. Display name, gross pay, taxes, and net pay. Even if you're really smart, really, really smart and know how to pay no income tax at all, the tax withheld for this project must be 21%. The first thing to do when given a programming task is to figure out what the output should look like. Draw it out on paper. As the project progresses, don't worry if the actual program output doesn't look exactly like your original plan. Plans can change. Pseudo code is fake code. It is code that is not really in any programming language. It's more like English. A lot of times, pseudo code is given to the programmer to say, here's how I want the program to work, and it's up to the programmer to write the code in Java, C, C++, or whatever language is being used. In this input process output chart, also called an IPO chart, we want to define the inputs. In this case, it's the name, hours, and pay rate, and the outputs, name, gross pay, taxes, and net pay. First, identify the inputs and outputs. Once we know these, we need to decide how to get from the input all the way to the output. We're going to read the name, hours, and pay rate from the keyboard. Determine the number of regular hours. Determine the number of overtime hours. Compute the regular pay, compute the overtime pay, and then compute the gross pay. Compute taxes, and finally, the net pay. That's what's left over after everything has been taken out. Finally, display the name, gross pay, taxes, and net pay. I'm going to use flowcharts to continuously break the program into smaller manageable parts. Flowcharts are used to represent different steps of a program. The most commonly used symbols are those in the left column. A circle or rounded rectangle is used to indicate the beginning or end. The parallelogram is used for input or output. The rectangle represents some type of process and the diamond is used to represent a decision. Other symbols can be used to represent subroutines, functions, disks, databases, etc. Although flowcharts are not used as often as they once were, they still help give a visual representation of how a program is organized. The concept of structured programming states that all programs can be created with only three constructs, sequence, selection, and repetition, or a combination of any of them. Sequence is the easiest to understand. Program steps are executed sequentially, one after another. Many times, the order in which steps are executed is very important. Other times, it does not matter. For example, if I were baking a cake, it may not matter very much whether I put the egg in the bowl and then the flour, or I reverse the two before mixing them with water. 
However, it would make a lot of difference if I put that cake batter in a 9 by 13 baking dish and placed it in the oven for 1 hour and 30 minutes, took it out, and then turned the oven on to 350 degrees. Yuck! This simplified flowchart shows the sequence of steps that are required for the program. There are no loops, so the repetition structure is not needed. In another slide, I'm going to expand the Compute Paycheck box to show a lot more detail. Here are two examples showing hours worked with an example of $20 per hour. The first example shows $37, which is less than 40 hours, therefore there is no overtime. All 37 hours should be paid at $20 per hour. The second example shows 45 hours. Therefore, the first 40 hours should be paid at the standard rate of $20 an hour, but the overtime of 5 hours should be paid at time and a half. That makes the overtime hours paid at $30 an hour. The easiest way for the program to compute the pay is to separate the hours into regular hours and overtime hours, and then compute the pay separately for each and then add them together. I have expanded the flowchart to show more detail in computing the paycheck. The center column uses a diamond to represent the decision. The program needs to look at all the hours worked to see if they are less than or equal to 40. In this case, regular hours are set to the number of hours worked and the overtime hours are set to zero. I'm choosing to use an abbreviation and call regular hours as reg hours. How Ever, if the test condition of hours are less than or equal to 40 is not true, then there's some overtime. Therefore, we set the regular hours to 40 and set the overtime hours to anything over 40. If hours is 43, then the person worked 40 hours at regular pay and had 3 hours of overtime. Overtime hours equal hours minus 40, which is 3. I can also call overtime hours as OT hours. We can then proceed to compute the gross pay, payroll taxes, and net pay, and then to display them. We need to remember that a payroll tax is collected on the money that you make, and sales tax is collected on the money you spend. In this project, we are working with the payroll tax. Program Organization most of the programs you will write will be organized like this. Use comments to place a title block at the top of each file. The title block identifies what this part of the program does as well as the date, version, and programmer's name. It can be very frustrating later on when there are many files that make up a program and you look at a file that contains code and have no idea what the code does. You then need to Reanalyze or reverse engineer the code instead of just looking at a short description in the title block. Many companies want the programmers to place their name in the file in case anybody has any questions about the file. The date and version number also help identify the latest version of the program. Some Java programs have a package statement. Development systems such as Eclipse and NetBeans may create a package for your code which is useful in organizing a large project with multiple files. If you create a project using Eclipse or NetBeans and see a package statement at the top of your code, then leave it in. But if you create a project using online GDB, then you should not use the package statement. The first part of the real code contains the import statement and any global variables and constants. Next is the main body of the program with its four subsections. List of variables, input, process, output. Next, convert the algorithm into code. The real work gets done during the input processing and output sections. Most of what is in the first and last sections is really just housekeeping to get the program started and shut down. Enter the program. Get a copy of the code from the class website and print it if you can. The code is provided as an image file. You need to type the program yourself to complete the lab project. 
you will learn far more by entering the program yourself than if you have someone else enter it in or use a scanner to convert the image of the program code into actual Java code. Be very careful when typing in a Java program. A name for Java class should start with a capital letter. For example, class Paycheck. The name of the disk file for the program should have the same name as the class name, but with a .java file extension. Except for comments, Java is case sensitive, which means that uppercase letters A through Z are treated completely different from the lowercase letters, small a through small z. Do not put spaces in the middle of variable names. Example, overtime pay has no spaces. Watch the placement of the semicolon character. It does not appear at the end of every line. Use backslash n to move the cursor to the next line when outputting text. The backslash n uses backslash, not a forward slash. Pay close attention to the parentheses, the curly braces, and the angle brackets. The title block at the top of the program file uses the block style comment starting with a slash star and ending with a star slash. The comment block identifies what is in the file as well as the inputs and outputs. Some companies want the programmer's name in the title block, others don't. I want your name in the title block and I will look for it when I grade your projects. Although not shown here, another couple of things that are actually placed in the title block are the version number and the date. This can help determine the latest versions of the code when there are multiple files that are not the same. The line package paycheck semicolon is not needed when using either the online compiler or the command line compiler. The import java util dot scanner semicolon brings in the code for the program to read from the keyboard if using the scanner object. Java is an object-oriented programming language. Objects are defined with the class statement. Each Java class must be in its own file and the name of the file needs to be the same as the class with the .java extension. The Paycheck program is defined with public class Paycheck and must be in the file named Paycheck.java. The curly braces, open curly brace, close curly brace, are used to identify the start and end of a block of code or data. Many other programming languages use the words begin and end instead of curly braces. Each open curly brace needs to have a matching close curly brace. The close curly brace for the public class paycheck is at the end of the file. This means that everything else in the file belongs to public class paycheck. Java does not have the exact same thing as a constant definition like C++ or Visual Basic, but the same thing can be accomplished using public static final to define the equivalent of a constant. For normal identifiers like variables, subroutines, methods, and objects, it is traditional to use the camel case method for names with the first word in each name capitalized. Class definitions typically have the first letter capitalized, but variables, subroutines, and methods leave the first letter in lowercase. To make constants easier to identify, they're usually done with all capital letters and use the underscore character to separate words instead of spaces. Constants are used later in the program so that the values will have a name instead of just a number. For example, when tax rate is used in the expression, taxes equal gross pay times tax rate semicolon, it is much better than taxes equal gross pay times 0.17 semicolon because someone else looking at the program may wonder where the 0.17 came from and why it is there. If 0.17 were used, it would be referred to as a magic number. Who knows how it got there? Another reason to define tax rate at the top of the program is that it may end up being used more than once in a larger program. Changing where it is defined makes sure that it gets changed everywhere. 
A comment is provided for both overtime rate and tax rate, so the next person reading the program will know what the numbers actually mean. Depending on where you work, some companies permit closely related variables to be defined on the same line, while others require that each variable be on its own line. A comment should follow any variable definition that is not perfectly clear from its name. When writing a console application, it is necessary to output a prompt message to the screen that requests data from the person running the program. If you don't have a prompt message, all the user will see is a flashing cursor and probably think that the program crashed. Try to think of yourself as two different people when writing a program that has a user interface. One, as the program developer, you need to have a program display a prompt message asking the user for each input, such as name, hours, and pay rate. Two, think of yourself as the user when running the program. When you see the prompt message, you will know it's your turn to type your name, the number of hours, or pay rate. Don't have the program code display a 40 and then just sit there waiting for something to be typed. When writing a prompt message, I like to end the prompt with a colon and a space to let the user know they need to type something in. The space after the colon is to make the screen look nice so that what the user types won't be right next to the prompt. It is necessary to create a scanner object in order to input data from the keyboard. You can give the scanner object any name you wish, but make it descriptive. In the past, I have used scanner input and scanner keyboard. In this example, I'm using standard STDIN, where STDIN is short for standard input. Whatever name you use as the definition, this is the name that you need to use later in the program when reading from the keyboard. David Eck, the author of a textbook, has provided the Text.io user interface that makes the program much more user-friendly. When including Text.io in your program, it checks to see if the characters typed as the user input are appropriate for the data type in the program. It has the program retry the user's input if the information type does not look good. On the other hand, programs using scanner for keyboard input will crash and die if the characters typed are not appropriate for the expected data type. For the Paycheck program, I want you to use scanner, especially for the next lab. You will be identifying different types of errors that can occur with a computer program. The if-else statements are used to identify the number of regular hours worked and the number of overtime hours. The if statement has a logical expression enclosed within parentheses that is tested to see if the hours are less than or equal to 40. The logical expression must evaluate to either a true or a false. When the expression evaluates to true, that means that there is no overtime and the block of code attached to the if statement is executed. When the expression evaluates false, the block of code attached to the if statement is skipped over and the code attached to the else statement is executed. The curly braces, open curly brace, close curly brace, identify the begin and end of each block of code. If there is no overtime, just set the regular hours to the number of hours worked and the overtime to zero. If there is overtime, the first 40 hours get paid at the regular rate, but anything over 40 gets paid at time and a half. Set the regular hours to 40 and the overtime hours to anything over 40. The computations for reg pay and overtime pay are fairly straightforward. Reg pay equals hours times pay rate. Overtime pay equals overtime hours times pay rate times the overtime rate. The overtime rate is from the constant 1.5 at the top of the program. The gross pay, pay before taxes or any other deductions, is the sum of rig pay and overtime pay. Taxes are based on the tax rate defined at the top of the program. Net pay is anything left over from the gross pay after the taxes have been deducted. 
The system.out.printf statements in this program each have two parts. The first part is the format string, which is enclosed in double quotes. Plain text in the format string identifies what is to be displayed on the screen. The part of printf's format string when displaying the name is a replaceable parameter. Percent %s tells printf to display the string whose data follows the quote and comma. In this case, it is the text that was entered into the name variable with name equal stdin dot next line, open close parentheses, semicolon. Be careful to use backslash n, not a forward slash n. The format string is a little different when displaying numeric data. Quote, your pay is dollar sign followed by the format specifier percent point to f and then the backslash n and the closing quote which moves the cursor down to the next line. The percent point to f tells printf to replace the percent point to f with the data that is in the next printf parameter. The F identifies that the data is expected to be of type double, and the point two says display two digits past the decimal. If pay were computed at 803.0, then the output on the screen would show your pay is space dollar sign 803.00, and then the backslash N moves the cursor down to the next line. Remember how printf displays two digits past the decimal. You will need this in future lab assignments. We open the scanner object near the top of the program as one of our resources, and we should close it when we are done with it. We will need to do something similar in later programs when we open a disk file. What is this program missing? This may seem like a big task for your first program, but a lot of code is missing to make a robust program that is more user-friendly and able to detect and handle bad inputs. Here are some of the things that are missing that we will need to learn how to process in later projects. Check for negative hours pay rate or taxes. Check for hours greater than 168. That's the maximum number of hours in one week. Check for excessive pay rate or tax rate. Check for illegal inputs. Since this program can process a paycheck that does not have overtime, 40 hours or less, and also a paycheck that has overtime, more than 40 hours, it is also important to test the program at 40 hours to make sure that the program did not check for only greater than and less than and skip testing for 40. It is important to test for each of the possible conditions. Project documentation and lab report. A multi-page text document for the lab report is provided. Most of the lab report for this first project is already filled in. You need to complete the rest of the lab report. You need to complete the test values and results table. I have already provided some sample test values. If you use any values other than 39, 40, and 41 hours or a pay rate other than $20 an hour, you need to update this table. Use a calculator to compute the expected results and then put in what was computed by your program in the actual results column. Don't just copy the program output into the expected results column. Otherwise, how are you going to know if the program is actually producing the correct results? When you submit your lab assignment, I may be comparing the data in this table to the screenshots that are also part of the lab report. In the discussion section of the lab report, you need to write what you did to develop the program, any problems you had, and how you overcame those problems. I don't expect a lot of writing, but I want you to describe what you did for the project. I realize that not everyone taking this class may have perfect English. Try your best. I may mark up your report for English composition problems to help you in writing, but I will not take off any points for your English. This is a programming class, not English 1A. The lab has instructions on how to copy just a small portion of the screen. 
If you place a screenshot of the entire screen, I may not be able to read the output of your program. If this happens, I may ask that you resubmit your lab report. Congratulations on completing your first Java assignment. Refer back to this lab assignment when working on future labs for instructions on creating new Java programs. And a special thanks to David Eck for sharing his textbook, Introduction to Programming Using Java. Dan Dolph, signing off for now. See you around for the next video.